next session will be uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amesh with Dr. Fadi. Fadi Mojoud. Dr. Mazan Sadqi. Dr. Hassan Dagar. Dr. Hussam Saradi. Dr. Ali Abu Rumman. Mirvat. Mirvat Safar Timbarah. مين حابب يكون موجود بال سمير تفضل سمير حسام you can present all right, it's, it's a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, actually my mentor, my boss, uh, my teacher, uh, Dr. Clifford Kavinsky, who is uh, uh, Section Chief of Intervention Structural Cardiology at Rush University Medical Center. He's going to give us two talks uh, about uh, what, what's new in transcatheter mitral and tricuspid valve therapies. Thank you, Sam. And uh, I want to thank all the organizers of the meeting to give me this opportunity to give you a quick overview of where we stand with percutaneous valve therapies as it applies to the mitral and tricuspid positions. I'm going to start off by talking about the tricuspid valve uh, position. And, uh, you know, tricuspid regurgitation is extremely common. I think you all know that. You see it all the time. Uh, there are uh, many patients who have severe TR. Those are the risk factors down there, patients who are older, patients who have underlying heart disease. Now, as you know, probably, uh, tricuspid regurgitation can be classified into primary versus secondary. Primary, where there is an underlying structural uh, disorder of the tricuspid valve apparatus, the leaflets, the annulus, the papillary muscles, the chordal structures. And then secondary, uh, tricuspid regurgitation, uh, I'll talk about in a second. But I want to take one moment to talk about pace later, pacemaker-induced tricuspid regurgitation. I think this is an under-recognized phenomenon or patients who have wires going through their tricuspid valve can prop open the tricuspid valve leaflet and over time cause, cause multi multiple morphologic changes in the tricuspid valve leading to chronic TR. And this is not a benign entity. You can see on the right side that pacemaker-induced tricuspid regurgitation has a negative impact on long-term survival. Secondary tricuspid regurgitation is where the structure of the tricuspid valve is normal and the tricuspid regurgitation is due to left-sided heart disease or intrinsic, pul intrinsic pulmonary vascular disease. And uh, over time, then, the right-sided chambers dilate, the annulus dilates, and you get the RV enlargement, malcoaptation, and regurgitation. So echocardiography is extremely important in differentiating the, the different forms of tricuspid regurgitation and its hemodynamic consequences. And uh, the classification of tricuspid regurgitation has undergone a kind of a revamping. No longer is it just a mild, moderate, and severe. Uh, there are now five classifications, mild, moderate, severe, massive, and torrential. These all have very specific definitions in terms of vena contracta and other parameters of echocardiographic assessment of uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So this is common nomenclature now, not just three classifications, but five. And these are not trivial differences, seeing that uh, torrential and massive uh, tricuspid regurgitation have independent risk factors for negative survival over time in comparison to less severe forms of TR, such as severe, moderate, or mild. And uh, I think we also underestimate the impact of isolated tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, long ago, uh, in the United States, we see a lot of patients who are intravenous drug users who actually have their, uh, who have endocarditis, and the surgeons actually remove their tricuspid valves, and they do well for years, but in the end, they start to deteriorate. Here we see the long-term impact of chronic TR on clinical outcomes in this study of 353 patients. And you can see that with worsening levels of tricuspid regurgitation, their long-term survival over 10 years really starts to decrease. So TR is not a benign disease as we originally thought years ago. And here, once again, we see redemonstrated the negative impact of cardiac events uh, on uh, severe and massive 
uh, tricuspid regurgitation. So clinical uh, TR is a real problem which I think has been underappreciated and undertreated. The management of uh, tricuspid regurgitation is woefully inadequate. Uh, really the only treatment we have Pointer's not working. The, really, the only treatment we have is diuretics. You see on the bottom there, diuretics are really the only effective treatment we have for tricuspid regurgitation. After that, it's uh, really nothing. And the recommendations for tricuspid valve intervention historically have been just largely surgical. Surgery has been really the only invasive approach we have to treating chronic tricuspid regurgitation. And uh, the, the price tag for surgical treatment of isolated tricuspid regurgitation is significant. Uh, survival after isolated tricuspid regurgitation surgery uh, only runs around 65 to 70 percent, and this has been shown multiple demonstrations in multiple different uh, meta-analyses. So the uh, surgery for tricuspid regurgitation is associated with significant uh, mortality. And these are the independent predictors for negative outcomes after tricuspid valve surgery. Uh, there's no uh, magic here. People who are older, people who have underlying heart disease, people who have underlying uh, liver disease are all at risk for developing complications after tricuspid valve surgery. And I think part of the reason is that we send patients for surgery too late. I think we watch them and, uh, you know, we don't want to send them to surgery until, you know, they're in like class four heart failure with ascites and then we finally send them. And of course, those patients, when they go to surgery, are not going to have a good outcome. So as a result, tricuspid regurgitation is largely left untreated. Uh, if you look worldwide, uh, there are many, many patients who have chronic TR, and very few of these patients ever get any kind of treatment. And the, so the current status of tricuspid valve disease is that it is underdiagnosed and undertreated. It's very prevalent, and uh, it can impact adversely uh, on survival if left untreated. The impact of surgery is really unrewarding. It has, uh, it has a high mortality rate, and uh, if you leave it, if, if you're performing left-hearted left-sided heart surgery on a mitral valve, for example, it will have a negative impact. Uh, historically, most treatments for chronic TR have been surgical, and the options are limited for patients who have pulmonary hypertension or RV dysfunction, and medical therapy is largely just some diuretics. So we've been looking for other ways to treat uh, chronic TR that don't involve surgery. And there's been a lot of uh, activity in this area over the last several years. Some have focused on uh, treating uh, with catheter-based techniques the annuloplasty, doing suture-mediated annuloplasty, or even putting direct ring annuloplasty by putting a little uh, not catheter-based uh, ring around the tricuspid annulus. Uh, there have been coaptation enhancement techniques like edge-to-edge -edge repair, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit more, and uh, most recently, valve replacement. Now, I've been in this field for a long time, and any therapy, which is going to have uh, real durability as it rolls out to the community, has to be simple, effective, reproducible, and not have a lot of complications. So some of these techniques I've disregarded because they don't fit that uh, pattern. So I'm going to focus on just a couple of these as we move forward. You can see a bunch of these different techniques are now in clinical trial. The one that I'm going to talk about first is the edge-to-edge -edge repair of the tricuspid valve using uh, in the so-called triluminate trial. This is a re-engineered system that was originally developed for the mitral valve, has now been adapted to the tri tricuspid valve to treat chronic TR. This is the control system and the steerable guides. And the triluminate trial took patients, 450 patients, which was just completed, uh, who have severe symptomatic tricuspid regurgitation. And the primary efficacy endpoint for this study was mortality, a need for tricuspid valve surgery, heart failure hospitalizations, and quality of life improvement. Well, this trial was just completed and published in the New England Journal of Medicine this past spring, and it was a positive trial. In fact, in that the uh, endpoint, the primary efficacy endpoint was reached, and you can see it in the right side. The primary efficacy endpoint was largely dictated by improvement in symptoms. Now, uh, this is important because what I'm going to show you is that even though 
uh, you didn't completely eliminate the patient's tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, the patient still had significant clinical benefit. If you could decrease their grade of tricuspid regurgitation by two grades, they have significant clinical improvement. So there's sort of a disconnect between the re eliminating the tricuspid regurgitation and the improvement in clinical, uh, clinical outcomes in terms of heart failure hospitalizations and improvement in symptoms of heart failure. So the theme is you don't have to eliminate the TR completely. If you could just decrease it by two grades, the patient will get significant clinical improvement. This has also been shown in the SCOUT-1 trial, which was a percutaneous annuloplasty uh, trial for chronic TR, and it also showed basically that although you didn't completely eliminate the tricuspid regurgitation, the patient still had real clinical benefit in terms of heart failure symptoms if you could decrease their grade of tricuspid regurgitation by two grades or more. Here's an uh, example of a patient we did, 76 year old with uh, multiple comorbidities. He came to us at Rush University with uh, complaints of chronic heart failure and his diuretics were completely ineffective. Here's his echocardiogram. You can see his right uh, ventricle is, is huge as is his right atrium. And here's his tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, it's uh, at least severe, could be uh, massive or torrential, I can't really tell. So the patient was then enrolled in the Triluminate trial where we put a clip on the tricuspid valve and then that clip becomes a permanent implant on the valve. This is the fluoroscopy of that procedure. You can see us deploying the valve in the left panel, then release, or deploying the clip in the left panel, and then releasing the clip in the center, and that's the final result, and this is the final echocardiogram. You can see that the TR is virtually obliterated. After the procedure, the patient was markedly improved, improved in terms of his shortness of breath. He was sent home and continues to do well today. There is also a second technology which is out there, just for the sake of completeness, called the Pascal system, which is also a transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair system, very much like the triclip system, uh, only it's uh, made by a different, uh, uh, a different manufacturer, Edwards Pharmaceutical, Edwards, Edwards Life Sciences. And you can see it works very much similar to a tricuspid clip. It has also been studied in the, it's being studied in the tricuspid space and uh, the results of that have yet to be released. Uh, but uh, the antici it's anticipated that it will perform equally as well as MitraClip uh, in the tricuspid position. Ultimately, though, uh, people have high hopes for tricuspid valve percutaneous replacement. This is probably one of the most interesting and promising technologies we have right now. This is the Evoke tricuspid valve replacement, which is an Edwards uh, life sciences product uh, designed for transfemoral delivery, available in three sizes, 28 French delivery system, steerable delivery system. It is a bovine pericardial valve attached to a nitinol frame, and it has a bunch of anchors that you can see there. And uh, those anchors allow fixation on the valve. And uh, basically what you do is just replace the valve uh, from the right femoral vein. And uh, it's not dangerous, it is, it is meticulous. It takes time to do this properly. But uh, this, uh, this valve system is currently under study in clinical trial and uh, the initial results have been quite promising. This is the early feasibility study. Uh, of the evoked valve, and you can see on the right panel there at baseline and discharge, uh, most patients had their tricuspid regurgitation uh, completely eliminated. This, uh, this valve could get FDA approval in the United States soon. This is another interesting uh, technology which I want to bring to your attention called the trick valve. Now the trick valve is different in that the valve is not really going to be implanted in the tricuspid annulus. It is uh, two valves for one procedure. You're going to uh, implant a valve in the SVC and a second valve in the IVC. Those uh, pro will provide unidirectional flow up to the heart and therefore will prevent regurgitation down to the abdomen and up to the thorax by having a valve in the SVC and IVC. And you will therefore avoid any interaction with the tricuspid valve annulus. It therefore will be compatible with pacemaker leads and no problem with uh, coaptation gaps. And uh, you don't have to interact at all with the, with the annulus. 
This is what it, the trick valve system looks like. It's bovine pericardium. Again, one valve for the SVC, which you'll place uh, at the SVC RA junction, and one valve in the IVC, which you'll place at the IVC RA junction. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is the product description, and here's sort of a fluoroscopy, uh, left upper panel showing the deployment of the SVC valve, middle panel showing the deployed SVC valve, uh, and on the right you can see it as well, and in the bottom you're showing deployment of the IVC valve. So I think this, this valve system has a lot of promise because it is not complicated to put in, it is very safe, and this is the kind of thing that I could see getting rolled out to the general interventional cardiologist for treatment of chronic tricuspid regurgitation. As we look to the future also, the Intrepid valve, which is a Medtronic product, uh, is going to be studied in the tricuspid position. I'm going to talk a little bit about more about that in the mitral talk. <clears throat> and I'd like to finish up with uh, another application of TABR technology in the 60-year-old woman who has, uh, sh who has um, severe uh, shortness of breath and heart failure. She's had an open mitral commiserotomy, a mechanical mitral valve repair, and a tricuspid valve annuloplasty with a 28-millimeter uh, MC3 ring. And now that ring is severely regurgitant. You can see market elevation of her right heart pressures. Here's an aortogram. You can see the mechanical mitral valve prosthesis and the tricuspid valve ring. And it was our decision to proceed with placing a TAVR valve, a Edwards valve, in the ring. Here's her baseline intraprocedural echoes showing severe TR. And here we are going from the jugular approach. I prefer the jugular approach for tricuspid uh, delivery. Uh, across the ring and then deploying a valve using the ring to anchor the valve. And there we are, fully deployed. Post ring deployment shows minimal TR. And there we are, it looks good. Patient did well. So in conclusion, percutaneous therapy for the tricuspid valve disease will continue to expand over the next several years. Newer non-surgical treatments will replace isolated tricuspid valve surgery, for sure. Catheter-based repair and replacement platforms will eventually become part of the toolkit of the structural proceduralist, and I anticipate real growth here over the next several years. And with that, I'll stop the discussion of tricuspid valve there. Thank you, Dr. Kavinsky. Uh, I think for the sake of time, we'll move to the second yes. uh, talk uh, about transcatheter mitral valve therapies. So now we're going to clear that away, and we're going to focus on the mitral valve. Mitral valve. So, uh, slideshow. Swip. Okay. So now uh, we're going to talk about transcatheter mitral valve therapies, and I like to title this, We Still Have a Long Way to Go, and you're going to see why. The objectives here are to review currently available uh, investigational therapies, commercially available, and investigational percutaneous therapy for mitral valve repair and replacement, to discuss limitations of our percutaneous valve repair systems, to discuss challenges in developing percutaneous valve replacement platforms for the native mitral position, and new promising percutaneous valve replacement platforms for native and post-operative mitral valve. So there's a lot of mitral regurgitation. Just like there's a lot of tricuspid regurgitation, there's a lot of mitral regurgitation in the world. Lots and lots of patients. But you know what? Very few of these patients are ever treated with surgery. Very few ever get mitral valve surgery, even though they have symptomatic severe MR, and it is identified and agreed upon that that's their problem. Very few patients ever get the surgery. Now, part of the problem is that the mitral valve, unlike the aortic valve, which is just a door that opens and closes in response to a pressure gradient, the mitral valve is a much more complicated structure of an annulus, leaflets, papillary muscles, and chordal structures. And the opening and closing is an active process involving contraction of the papillary muscles. Much more complicated uh, apparatus than the aortic valve. And as with the tricuspid valve, we can classify chronic TR as primary, where there's an intrinsic disorder of the mitral valve apparatus. 
and secondary, where there is a, an anatomically normal mitral valve, but uh, mitral valve regurgitation is due to usually left-sided heart disease, coronary disease, myocardial disease, idiopathic myocardial disease, leading to annular dilatation, male coaptation, and chronic mitral regurgitation. There have been percutaneous techniques developed to treat chronic mitral regurgitation. This is the original MitraClip system, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair using more uh, contemporary terminology, which is a clip system delivered through a steerable guide that you place uh, uh, transvenously and then go transeptal uh, across the interatrial septum, position the clip over the regurgitant valve orifice, and then deploy the clip. And uh, I think I've shown you this before. You all should have some acquaintance with this technology. I'm not going to go through the entire video here, but I think you guys get the idea. This, this technology has been extensively studied in clinical trial. In the Everest, uh, in the Everest 1 trial, Everest, I meant the Everest 2 trial, it was compared to surgery for chronic degenerative or primary mitral regurgitation in a randomized way. And the uh, results of the Everest II trial showed that although surgery, when you repair the valve, uh, gives you superior reduction in absolute mitral regurgitation, both techniques are equally effective, surgery and mitroclip, in improving symptoms of heart failure. And that just makes sense, right? And uh, these results have held out even to five years after completion of the study. So uh, the mitral clip system has also been studied in patients with secondary mitral regurgitation in the so-called COAP trial. Uh, this trial was a heart failure trial, the endpoints being uh, recurrent hospitalizations for heart failure at 12 months. And you can see in this slide that mitral clip can be very effective in reducing uh, mitral regurgitation in patients with, uh, with uh, <coughs> secondary MR. You can see a 92.7% reduction uh, after treatment to less than two plus for all the patients enrolled in the study. And you can see that all cause mortality is improved in patients who got mitroclip to treat their chronic MR for secondary tricuspid regurgitation. This holds true for both the combined endpoint of death or heart failure hospitalizations. And the number needed to treat to see an effect is only four and a half patients. So the COAP trial is very effective in showing that mitroclip can improve patient outcomes in, with secondary MR in terms of hospitalizations for heart failure and even mortality. So much so that in the United States, the guidelines put transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair of the mitral valve for secondary MR as a class 2A recommendation ahead of surgery, which has not really been shown to have the same benefits or improve survival. And I just want to point out that MitraClip for secondary MR has been shown to be as effective, if not more effective, than many of the pharmaceutical agents that we use to treat chronic heart failure. So I show this slide to all my heart failure colleagues to point out the fact that these patients need to be referred for MitraClip treatment of their chronic MR. Now, as with the tricuspid space, there's also a second uh, technology from Edwards Life Sciences, the Pascal device, which has been studied for uh, in primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation, and uh, in recent published data has been shown to be non-inferior to MitraClip, and for that reason has received an FDA approval in the United States. What I want to point out in this slide, as I use this as a segue to the next portion of my talk, is that although we are successful in reducing mitral regurgitation with transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair, leaving behind residual mitral regurgitation has a negative impact on survival, which you see on the right panel. Patients who have residual mitral regurgitation, one plus, two plus, or three plus, have a gradient of increasing mortality or decreasing uh, favorable outcomes with residual mitral regurgitation after transcatheter edge to edge repair. So although we can improve the symptoms and we can improve mortality, any residual MR left behind has a clinical impact. And the, the shortcomings of transcatheter edge to edge repair are seen here. 
I think uh, part of the problem is uh, the unpredictability of success with this procedure. It is highly uh, complicated and requires a lot of experience to get good at this. And you know, if you think about it, once you put clips on the valve, it limits future therapeutic options. So people have been looking at other catheter-based techniques to treat chronic mitral regurgitation, and I'm gonna uh, focus on a few of them right now. Everyone has, was excited by the success of TAVR for severe aortic stenosis. TAVR was studied extensively in randomized clinical trials, and all of these trials were very consistent in showing that uh, TAVR is superior to medical therapy and as good, if not superior to surgery, to treat severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. So people were excited that it would be easy then to translate the success seen in the aortic valve over to the mitral valve. And you can see there, there's not a single patient in, with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who cannot be considered for a TAVR procedure. In fact, in the United States, TAVR procedures outnumber surgical aortic valve replacement significantly. You can use TAVR technology, as Dr. Cerati showed in his talk, to treat uh, chronic mitral valve disease. And here is another example of implanting a TAVR valve inside a degenerated mitral valve prosthesis. You do a transeptal puncture, then you dilate, balloon dilate the inner atrial septum, and then you deliver your uh, valve delivery system across the septum and into the frame of the degenerated mitral bioprosthesis. Then you deploy the valve, and uh, you can see it being deployed here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Dr. Cerati really uh, covered this well. Here we are deploying a valve in the degenerated mitral prosthesis. Here's the valve fully deployed. And this is a very successful procedure. I've done this procedure 50, 60 times. So what is the problem then uh, developing a percutaneous mitral valve replacement just like for the TAVR, for the aortic valve? Well, the mitral valve, as I pointed out, is a much more complex procedure, uh, structure. It sits within the heart. You can't get to it from an external approach. The annulus is not planar, but it's more saddle-shaped. It's larger. <clears throat> the mitral valve is often not calcified. And as you know, the TAVR valves rely on calcification of the annulus for its uh, anchoring. Ongoing myocardial disease can lead to further annular dilatation and regurgitation. And then, as Dr. Cerati pointed out, you can get impingement and compromise of the left ventricular outflow tract. And the equipment is larger. There have been numerous uh, technologies which have been evaluated for the mitral space in terms of percutaneous uh, replacement. Uh, I have found three of them to have uh, viability and potential for generalized uh, study and development, and those are the three I've listed here. One is the Intrepid valve, the Tendine valve, or the Sapien M3 valve. They're different. Uh, the Medtronic Intrepid valve is on the left. Uh, the Tendine valve, which is only a transapical delivery, and then the Sapien valve. And I'm going to show you these right now. This is the Intrepid valve animation, uh, and it is designed as a double, sort of a double stented implant. The valve sits inside an external stamp, uh, stent, which has a bunch of anchors for placement. It's the transvenous now procedure. And what you're going to do is you're going to go transeptal, and you're going to deliver this valve uh, over the uh, mitral valve in this manner here. More or less like a mitral clip procedure, only bigger. I think we're talking, I think the latest, uh, tech, the latest rendition is 29 French. Anyway, this is how the valve is delivered. And there it is. Voila. So the uh, Intrepid valve has had a early feasibility study, which was uh, excellent in terms of uh, improving or eliminating mitral regurgitation. You can see in this slide that the mitral regurgitation essentially is eliminated with placement of the Intrepid valve. And now the Intrepid valve is being studied in a randomized clinical trial worth worldwide called the Apollo trial. The Apollo trial is going to take patients suitable 
for uh, percutaneous treatment and randomized them to transcatheter mitral valve replacement versus conventional surgery. And we're going to see how that uh, all turns out. The second valve I want to talk about is the Tendine valve. Uh, this Tendine valve is developed by Abbott and it is designed for transapical delivery only. Here's the, uh, here's the video of that. Again, it's a transapical delivery, so there's a left thoracotomy, small left thoracotomy that you have to perform in order to uh, puncture and dilate the left ventricular apex. And then the valve is delivered from the left ventricular apex. So for me, uh, this valve uh, platform isn't quite so desirable because it's not fully percutaneous. It does require a uh, left thoracotomy. And because of that, uh, the left thoracotomy, particularly in the very sick patients, uh, requires a uh, significant recovery. Their hospital stays longer, uh, but it, the valve does work. But I think the future, if I have to make a statement, is going to be an, on fully percutaneous transatrial atri <coughs> delivery of these platforms, not uh, trans, uh, transapical. The Tendine valve is being studied again in a new trial called the Summit Trial, which uh, at Rush we were part of. Here it is. The patients who are suitable are randomized, interestingly, to the Tendine valve versus Mitroclip. We'll have to see how that turns out. This is the, S the M3 valve, which is a product of uh, Edwards Pharmaceutical, and it actually utilizes uh, a uh, the Taver valve. What you do is you deploy a docking system which uh, lassoes the mitral apparatus like you see here. And then once you've placed that docking system then you will implant a, basically a Taver valve inside there. And I'll let this play through. Because this animation is quite informative. Once the dock is there it's just a simple matter of taking a Taver valve, in this case a Edwards Sapien valve, and just implanting it right inside that dock. And it works very effectively, but uh, placing the dock can be technically challenging, as we have found it. Early feasibility studies have been very promising, and now the valve is being studied in a randomized clinical trial called Encircle, which is nearing completion and will be completed this fall, and we'll be able to see uh, what the results are using the M3 system. Here's an example of a case of a patient with severe MR. Here we are deploying the dock, and there it is after the uh, valve is placed inside the dock. And you can see afterwards, valve looks good. There are other systems that are being developed to treat mitral regurgitation. The only other one I'm going to mention is the Carillon indirect annuloplasty technique, which is, takes advantage of the fact that the coronary sinus parallels the mitral valve annulus. And what you do is access the coronary sinus and put a rigid stent in the coronary sinus. And when you put that rigid stent in the coronary sinus, you then cinch it down. As you cinch it down, you shorten the mitral valve annulus. As you shorten the mitral valve annulus, the coaptation improves and uh, the mitral regurgitation uh, improves as well. This is, a, this is a study which is ongoing called the EMPOWER trial and uh, we'll have to see whether this technology really bears fruit. In conclusion, currently available percutaneous therapies for chronic MR are effective but have strong limitations, specifically transcatheter edge to edge repair. Percutaneous mitral valve replacement will continue to evolve but at a slower pace than TA TABR due to the technical difficulties related to mitral valve, as I have discussed. Percutaneous valve and valve and valve and ring procedures for mitral and tricuspid positions are reasonable approaches in patients with prior uh, cardiac surgery. And with that, I'll stop here and I'll thank you for your kind attention. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Kavinsky. Uh, good morning again. Um, I guess uh, I can introduce myself. Uh, I'm Dr. Hossam Suradi. Uh, I'm one of the interventional structure cardiologists at Rush University Medical Center. I'm a proud uh, prior trainee of Dr. Kavinsky as well as Dr. Ziad Hijazi, who is sitting here with us. It's great to see you, uh, and I'm uh, 
So Dr. Kavinsky's uh, uh, talk was a great segue for my talk where I'm gonna uh, share the case of uh, a mitra clip that was used to save a life of a patient with acute mitral regurgitation. Our patient is an 85-year-old female who presented with sudden onset shortness of breath and uh, decreased responsiveness about a day prior to presentation. In the ED, she was found to be hypoxic on room air, uh, relatively hemodynamically stable. She was found to have a holocystotic murmur over the apex radiating to the axilla with crackles mainly over the right lung. She has a prior history of multiple strokes. The last was about a month uh, prior to presentation, atrial fibrillation on anticoagulation, COPD, and hypothyroidism. And this is uh, her chest x-ray, which what was interesting about it, that she had like this unilateral consol consolidation involving the right lung, which potentially can be seen in acute mitral regurgitation. You can see unilateral meaning in the right side of the lung, uh, uh, consistent with pulmonary edema re related to the mitral regurgitation. Obviously, she had an echocardiogram next, uh, which showed uh, a prolapse uh, uh, of the posterior leaflet with severe eccentric mit uh, mitral regurgitation. Her LV uh, function was preserved as well as the right ventricular function. She subsequently was taken to the cath lab. Um, a coronary angiogram was performed, which showed normal coronaries. Uh, we did hemodynamic assessment, which again, um, where you found uh, severely elevated wedge pressure with impressive V, prominent V wave uh, uh, in the wedge tracing, uh, at least moderate to severe uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, moderate to severe uh, elevated right atrial uh, pressure with severely depressed cardiac output. Therefore, a balloon pump was placed in and the patient was transferred to the uh, cardiac ICU. She subsequently had a transesophageal echocardiogram, uh, which showed a flail uh, 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 P2 segment uh, related to a cord rupture that resulted in a severe mitral regurgitation. Another view, this is the LVOT view. Uh, again, you see the uh, flail segment here uh, with severe eccentric uh, anteriorly directed jet. So she was evaluated by uh, our cardiac surgery team who declined her due to her uh, old age, frailty, multiple comorbidities. And after uh, discussion in our uh, um, heart team uh, conference, basically we decided to proceed with the transcatheter mitral valve repair using uh, the mitral clip system. And Dr. Kavinsky touched base on the mitral clip. Uh, mitral clip uh, has been the only approved uh, device uh, for symptomatic degenerative or functional mitral regurgitation who are considered high risk for surgery. Recently, uh, the uh, Pascal device uh, from Edwards also uh, uh, received approval for patients with degenerative mitral regurgitation. And the concept of the mitral cl uh, clip is, base, is based on the Alfieri uh, surgical technique where uh, the central scallops of the anterior and posterior leaflets are sutured together to reduce the amount of the leakage. This system comes in different sizes. There are four different sizes uh, that we basically uh, select the proper size based on the anatomy of the mitral valve, the severity of the mitral regurgitation, what's the baseline uh, mitral valve gradient, and what's the size of the mitral valve uh, apparatus. And this is the video that uh, briefly Dr. Kavinsky showed. This is an animation of the mitral regurgitation. This is the mitral clip system, which is a 24 French uh, uh, profile that goes through the femoral vein uh, percutaneously. We usually pre-close the access site uh, with a per-close device uh, prior to insertion of this large uh, uh, delivery sheath. We perform a transeptal uh, puncture, as you can see here. And then the mitral clip uh, guide catheter is inserted in the left atrium. So the dilator and the wire are, are removed, followed by the uh, uh, advancement of the clip delivery system. And what's nice about this clip delivery system is it can be steered in any uh, way or orientation uh, based on the anatomy. This is really a TEE imaging uh, guided intervention. We don't really use much of flora for this procedure. So TEE is really very important. Once we're above the mitral valve apparatus, the mitral clip is opened. And then using this 3D on fast looking from the top of the mitral valve, we orient the clip arms perpendicular to the mitral valve plane. 
And once we're happy where, where the position of the clip is, we advance it into the left ventricle. And then, then this is retrieved back to grasp the leaflets. And if you've noticed that there are like a set of grippers on top of the clip that, can, that would basically grasp uh, the leaflet. If we're unhappy about it, we can let the leaflet go and reposition uh, the leaflet, uh, the clip as needed. And the goal is really to have this double orifice uh, configuration of the mitral valve. Once we're happy with it, uh, the clip is uh, deployed. And the clip stays in place. So let's go step by step about uh, uh, the patient that we've done. So we basically uh, obtained a transeptal puncture. Getting a proper transeptal location is very important uh, to give us enough height above the mitral valve. Typically, we want to be at least in the mid-posterior aspect of the interatrial septum. Usually, we use the bicaval and the short axis view of the TE. The bicaval basically tells us the superior inferior uh, dimension, uh, location of the transeptal needle. You basically look at the tenting of where the needle is, and the short axis tells us what's the anterior posterior uh, uh, relationship of the, uh, uh, of the septal puncture. And we basically need at least a four centimeter uh, height above the mitral valve plane. Again, this is the insertion of the guide catheter. Remember, it's a very large uh, delivery system. Uh, it's a 24 French. We pre-dilate uh, the skin area with the dilators. And then we advance this uh, guide catheter through the groin area under uh, fluoroscopy. Following that, we advance the clip delivery system, which we introduce it in, into the guide catheter. And you'll see here the clip delivery system uh, being advanced all the way to the uh, tip of the uh, guide catheter. And then comes the steering of the, this delivery system. Uh, there are two views that we really uh, use for ma maneuvering this uh, system. What we call the bicommissural view, which is 60 degrees, and the long axis view. The long axis view gives you the anterior-posterior relationship uh, of the mitral valve. The bicommissural view gives you the me medial and lateral relationship of the mitral valve. So once we're above the jet, uh, we basically open the clip arms, as you can see here, and the grippers are, uh, are lifted up, as you can see here. And then we obtain a 3D view so that we would look at the mitral valve from the top. This helps us in giving us the proper orientation so that the clip arms are perpendicular to the mitral valve leaflet. Generally, you want it to be like at the 12, 6 uh, p.m. Uh, 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 clock dimension. Then after that, the, the clip is advanced into the left ventricle. And under TEE, basically, it's, the system is pulled back until the leaflets are grasped. Once we have the leaflets, the grippers are deployed. And this is basically our result after the first clip, which there is significant improvement in the mitral regurgitation. And this is what we basically what you want to see, uh, the double orifice pattern and the uh, uh, adequate bridge between the anterior and posterior leaflet of the mitral valve. So we were happy with this. So the clip was deployed, uh, as you can see here. And then we decided uh, to, uh, to go with the second clip as there was still some mitral regurgitation that we can see, uh, although it was significantly improved. So we went with another clip, just medial. Remember, this is the bicommissional view. We go, this is medial, this is lateral. So we went medial to the first clip. We again used 3D orientation to tell us the exact orientation of the clip arms. Following that, uh, the clip arm was uh, advanced into the, ve the ventricle and uh, pulled back to grasp uh, the leaflets, followed by deployment of these grippers. And these after closing the clip, and this is the final result after putting two clips. So almost really gone mitral regurgitation, very, very trivial uh, amount left. Again, the 3D on FOSS uh, showing the uh, very nice uh, double orifice pattern of the mitral valve. It's very important to assess the transmitral gradient before deploying the clip. As, as you know, when we put the clips, it will 
sh shrink the size of the mitral valve, so it's important to, avoid, to make sure that we're not making the valve too stenotic. In this case, it was, less, uh, it was three. The goal is to have a gradient less than five in these cases. So we're happy with the result, and the second clip was deployed, as you can see here. Again, this is before and this is after um, the two clips. There was really remarkable improvement in the uh, V-wave LA tracing. So this is before where the V-wave was almost 46 millimeters mercury, and after uh, uh, the mitra clip, the V-wave dropped to the, uh, to the 30s. So patient really did very well. Subsequently, she was immediately extubated. We were able to remove the balloon pump afterwards, and she was discharged to rehab after three days. Uh, so in summary, this, uh, the uh, transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair uh, is a very demanding therapy. It really needs experienced operators and a lot of advanced imaging. This is basically it's an imaging-guided intervention. Um, it is the, the uh, transcatheter uh, repair is indicated in chronic mitral regurgitation, whether it's degenerative or functional etiology. There has been really very limited exp experience with acute MR, mainly you know smaller retrospective study, but uh, from our and uh, uh, others' experiences, this is very technically feasible with excellent outcomes in patients who don't really have any uh, other good alternative options. And thank you very much. Turn it on. Okay. It's a burning question here, but I don't know. He can, he can go ahead. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop. No, no, it's not a problem. Dr. Ahmed, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for organizing committee to give me this opportunity. Thank you very much for the Saudi Interventional Society and our Jordanian uh, Interventional Group. My uh, topic, following Dr. Clifford and Dr. Hussam, uh, they introduced me very well to, the, to my case, and it's about defining the odds about a very complex case that I want to share with you. So he is a 69-year-old male who is hypertensive. He has ischemic cardiomyopathy. He was found to have uh, three-vessel disease, severe aortic regurgitation, and severe mitral regurgitation. His uh, systolic dysfunction, um, in the, in the severe range, he is EF is 20%, and he has atrial fibrillation, and he's on walk. So he presented initially uh, with, uh, as a case of ACS, and found to have the three vessel disease, along with his valvular lesions. So the decision of the, our MDT multidisciplinary meeting is to go for surgery, cabbage, MVR, and AVR. The patient refuses, and, uh, or refused, and then the patient, uh, and the decision was uh, switched to percutaneous intervention, with the left main uh, PCI to a left main and left circumflex provisional technique with the stepwise approach with the tapping stenting to the left circumflex. So six months after that, he presented uh, to the our emergency uh, department with an ST elevation complicated with cardiogenic shock. At that time, uh, he has um, his an an angiogram that shows severe uh, instant stenosis in both uh, uh, in all left main, left circumflex, and LAD. Surgical consultation, the patient was deemed a surgical, not a surgical candidate. Now the plan is to optimize his medical therapy, but he de deteriorates very uh, fast, and then we had to do something about that. So uh, we consented the patient for a high-risk uh, PCI. So the problem that uh, we have is the mode of uh, failure to his stent in the less than one, uh, one year, and I need to do an imaging in order to do that and to find what's, what's going on in there. Is it whether that is mechanical versus new intimal hyperplasia? And uh, the other problem that he has a cardiogenic shock secondary to ICS and the presence of severe aortic regurgitation. So can I support this PCI with a, a mechanical circulatory support? Uh, and the, sec a thir uh, the a third, uh, the last but not least, is the, what should I do to mitral regurgitation? So let's deal with the coronary artery disease, fix the perfusion to the left circumflex, dominant left circumflex, and then discuss further what to do with that. So I will just show you what how the uh, aortic, severe aortic stenosis looks like, and his systolic dysfunction is severely impaired. And that's my hospital. RCA is non-dominant. 
And here is the coronary angiogram. You can see in the left side that his left main is, has an osteal uh, left main severe stenosis, distal left main severe stenosis, and uh, osteal LED, osteal left circumflex. You can appreciate in the cranial view the same. So, so the decision is to, to go forward and, and to do ultrasound access to the, uh, and this is the second session. The uh, diagnostic uh, angiogram was done, and then he was taken for the high risk procedure. So ultrasound guided uh, access, then uh, a peripheral angiogram to uh, find the vessels. You can notice the flow to the coronary uh, with the because of severe aortic regurgitation and because of the severe systolic dysfunction. So we decided to go in an ample. Has LVEDB with this GR4 that uh, it was 26. So definitely he has a, uh, he needs a MCS. I was hoping that they, the embella will work, knowing that he has severe aortic regurgitation and not to have that virtuous cycle and, uh, between, between the aortic valve and the, and the motor. So we fixed it and we, have look, uh, we keep looking at the blood pressure and blood pressure for systolic from 80, it goes up to motorized 130. So we're so happy that this is the case. And then we um, will go fast here, ballooning to the left circumflex, ballooning to the of LED and time for Imaging. The uh, modality that I chose is the OCT, and the reason of that is obvious that I want to see exactly what's going on with the and, uh, new antimal hyperplasia and the amount of new antimal hyperplasia. In here, you can appreciate, okay, uh, anyway, so from here you can appreciate that there is and the longitudinal <coughs> axis down into the, uh, the vessel. Uh, at the tip, uh, this is the three pictures, the one to the left, to the far left side is the, at the tip of the guide catheter, and then one at but the distal left main, and the third one at the osteal LED. The left, uh, the and the and the uh, osteal uh, left main has underexpanded and the new intimal hyperplasia. The distal left main is definitely underexpanded stent, and the osteal <coughs> LED is underexpanded stent. Worth to mention that the indexed PCI was done non uh, imaging guided. So we, we know now what's going on. It's a mechanical plus a new intimal hyperplasia. So the decision is to go on and um, fix with the proper size ballooning uh, to the areas of, of under expansion. D drug lutent balloon followed by casing balloon to the ostea, to the osteal and the, to, the, to the distal left main. And also the pot with the proper size ballooning. And here is the pre, and you can see the, po the final result in, in the site, and you can see the pre result in comparison. And after that, it's the time to wean down the um, bella, find, uh, and we cross it with the, with the um, end hole, I mean, end hole catheter to look at the LVDB. The LVDB improved a little bit from 26 to 22, How, and we, when we the pressure was sustained, so we said that, fine, let's take him out of the bella and proceed. So two months after that, the problem that he has in ischemic heart disease with severe systolic dysfunction, and the patient is improving from chest pain point of view, we continue with triple therapy for three months, and then we put Plavix and NOAC, knowing that he has atrial fibrillation. Severe aortic regurgitation, we did a calcium scoring to his aortic valve, non-calcified aortic annulus. Severe functional MR, we uh, did the uh, multidisciplinary meeting, and we proceeded with an M tier. For the sake of uh, the time, for the time, I will go through the. This is the assessment of the, and this is the amount of the severe mitral regurgitation. Many jets, many uh, multi, uh, the 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 maximum jet is uh, at the A2 A2 B2 side, and this is the leaflet size. And look at the um, uh, atrial septal; it's thickened. The only fossa valves that is available was a very tiny one, so we had to do something about it. We have to balloon it and the height in the left atrium, as Dr. Hassam illustrated, it was proper. So we proceeded uh, with, and this is the 3D on FAS with, 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 with colors, and it shows you that uh, the, mainly the malcopitation to, and the functional MR is at the A2B2 side, and the center, uh, let's put it this way. So now this is the ballooning to the septum, and, and we cross the, with, the, with, the, with the steering guide into the, um, a wire first and then steering guide into the uh, left atrium and then this is the perpendicularity you can see to the right side that the clip is perpendicular to the uh, to the to mitral valve the grasping uh, view and this is uh, an explain to show you the bicom and the three chamber view 
and you can see that we, could, uh, we had a, a good, fairly good bite of, of the, uh, both leaflets, and that is a result that we got. It's a minimal uh, residual mitral regurgitation. Mean gradient is excellent. It's still very, and there is, uh, the flow reversal has improved. This is the figure of eight that you, you need to see in the transgastric view to, to assure that your, your clip is well seated and, and excellent. And that was illustrated by Dr. Osam too. And that is the uh, final uh, very satisfactory result. You can appreciate the MR pre and post in this uh, view. Six months after mitral uh, tear, uh, he is compensating. Aortic regurgitation did not worsen in severity. No, uh, and, uh, no further worsening of the LV dimension and volume. And MDT will continue treating the patient medically and to assess the feasibility of TAVR when we have the proper platform and also if it deems necessary. So the point to consider, mechanical circulatory support, especially M uh, Impella CP, can be considered in aortic regurgitation severe form after careful assessment of the uh, effective orifice area of aortic valve. Second thing, that mechanical circulatory support buys you time to appropriate imaging guided assessment of the instant restenosis in cardiogenic shock patients. Third, the MDT directed management of complex patient in, is the most appropriate course of action, including sophisticated decision making and exit bailout strategy. Uh, last but not least, we need, there is a need of dedicated TAVI platform for aortic regurgitation. Maybe in a couple of years that I will come to you presenting the Jenna Valve experience for this particular patient. Who knows? Thank you very much, everyone. May I have a question to Dr. Kavinsky? Dr. Kavinsky, uh, tricuspid valve, it was the forgotten valve in its disease, but it's now not forgotten. Uh, many patients we send for double valve, for example, for mitral uh, disease and very mild uh, tricuspid disease. But unfortunately, these patients after surgery, we found that they have significant uh, TR. Is there a predictor for the, this uh, phenomena, for the, this disease? I think that uh, surgeons should be very aggressive when they are operating on the left side of the heart treating uh, tricuspid regurgitation. It seems pretty clear that the tricuspid regurgitation after left-sided surgery often does not improve and may even progress. So uh, I think at the time of surgery, anything more than mild tricuspid regurgitation should be treated with a ring. And I think that should be the approach of cardiac surgeons. Do not leave behind tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, my question to Dr. Ahmed, uh, won't you think that there are valves now in the market that uh, suits AI better than other valves, uh, those there is, uh, w w w which deploy, uh, you know, uh, uh, proximal than distal? The problem with the, with the, with the uh, anchoring the valve is the issue now when you have Loss of care. Yeah, when you don't, don't have a, a good calci calcification in the valve and the uh, the native valve to anchor anchor the, yeah. the prosthesis, there is no for as of now there is no dedicated platform for aortic regurgitation isolated aortic regurgitation in the presence of no calcification. Maybe if, uh, if there is anything in the, uh, I, I don't think that the Jenna valve is uh, in the U.S. market yet, right? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. There's nothing dedicated for aortic regurg. Uh, you briefly mentioned the Jenna valve, uh, which uh, basically uh, it, it involves some clipping mechanism to the uh, aortic valve leaflet. Uh, it's, I think, I, I believe it's approved already in Europe, and it's going through clinical trial in the U.S. Uh, right so now. So what about the accurate valve, which deploy, you, you know, you fix it? And then you deploy it towards the valve. But it it comes uh, of giving uh, more stability to the to the system. Uh, all the expandable valves, if they do not have the radial force to anchor well at the, at the, the, the site, if there is no classification to hold them there. So I, I care it's one of the worst radial force platforms in for the market. Yes. So I don't. I, I, I believe that is a bit risky. Even that if you go oversized, it would turn into I mean, we, we've done some cases as off-label case using Medtronic, the uh, Evolute and Corval, oversizing the annulus, 
We had some cases where, you know, the valve tended to embolize, migrate the ventricle, and some of them really did. Likewise, uh, like six months ago, we deployed a, a, a metronic valve, but we used 34 uh, for pure AI. But that uh, guy was very symptomatic. He was an impending heart failure, and we fixed that without, and the valve was stable. Yeah. I think Dr. Kavinsky has a lot of experience with uh, Metronic in the aortic regurg uh, indication. Yeah, we, we've treated a bunch of patients with isolated AI with a Metronic valve. You gotta be very careful because with chronic AI, the annulus tends to dilate and you've got to make sure that the annulus is not so large that uh, you won't get uh, capture of your valve implant. But on this, your particular case, I'm very interested, because there was pretty severe AI and MR. How did you decide that the MR was the problem? Because as I think about it, reducing or eliminating the AI could have a salutary effect on the mitral regurgitation. So I'm interested to hear your decision for going after the mitral bell. Thank you very much. That's the beauty of the MDT, that you can blame everyone for that. When you will make a decision for a thing, and now that's just, and it's not about the task of the and the way we took the valve we fix. But we, uh, and, and looking at that, so the things that we can fix and, and help the patient. I know when the critical thinking and you have an, ex, uh, an outflow valve, you have to fix the outflow and leave the other valves because whenever they fix the outflow, the patient improves. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the classical way of thinking when it comes to value of complex valuation. However, we can fix the, 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 the mitral with, with edge to edge, and we can fix the coronaries. We can do the, anything to the other valve, and the patient is, is, is refusing any surgical intervention. So it's, it's the desperation that, that, that causes us to mm -hmm. think this way. There's no, there is no uh, critical thinking that can justify what we did, part of that we are so desperate to help. And in your case, I mean, there's limited options, you know, I mean, you don't have a, a minimally invasive option for your aortic valve, and you have potentially a, a, something you can treat the mitral valve, so it's definitely worth it to, to go, go after the mitral valve. So my question to Dr. Sarad, regarding the acute mitral clip for, uh, in acute MI, uh, especially in acute inferior MI with, uh, with rupture cordy. What I read in the literature is that the mortality reach up to 80 percent. Uh, do you think there is a place for acute uh, clipping uh, and, uh, you know? Absolutely. I mean, we, we've had really s s several cases so far. I've done one like two weeks ago, same, similar presentation. Uh, where the ru sudden ruptured cord, and uh, we treated it beautifully with one clip. Yeah. And it, uh, I mean, degenerative MR generally, it, it, it's, it's definitely worth to try to clip the, 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 the valve. Uh, if it was more restrictive, the posterior leaflet, you know, sometimes these ischemic MRs, the posterior leaflet is too short, it's too tethered, you would imagine it's difficult to grasp it and clip it. But cases like this where the cord ruptured, it's, it's definitely easy, especially with the newer generation mitral clip. With the fourth generation, there are longer arms, wider arms. Yes. Uh, the success of the procedure has been really very high. I so think I want to emphasize what uh, Usam is saying. The use of transcatheter edge to edge repair for acute MR is, it's just been not been studied in a randomized clinical trial. But it is a non-surgical approach that can be done quickly to stabilize a patient that's drifting into shock. And even if you don't get complete resolution of the MR, you can stabilize them uh, and make a non-surgical candidate into a surgical candidate that can be then treated with definitive mitral valve surgery. So Dr. C uh, Cliff, uh, one question about the tricuspid intervention. Uh, we see that the class, for example, has a spacer. The triclip doesn't have a spacer. And then we got the annual plasty technology, and then the uh, cable technology, the triclamp, and uh, then we have the, like uh, uh, more simpler uh, technologies. So, where do you see the future? How we can, uh, in the future, prove that this technology is better than the other, and how one operator in one institution can remember the you know the technical. Uh, 
the te technical details of each. Yeah. So that's a very complicated question. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think uh, it's going to be one modality for all patients. Each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, in terms of valve replacement, you know, the tricuspid valve for percutaneous valve replacement is tricky. It's a very large orifice. Anchoring the, pr the prosthesis is difficult. Um, this is why the cable implants have certain attractiveness because the, I could see that being a procedure that almost any structural proceduralist could do. And the, uh, the triclip system is also something that we can use uh, to stabilize a patient and doesn't close the door uh, if you're going to use it like a trick valve. Putting a clip on the tricuspid valve doesn't close that door. So I don't think it's going to be a singular uh, solution. I think there's going to be a toolbox. It's a hybrid, hybrid and the kind of, yeah. contemporary structural proceduralist will have to be facile with several of these technologies. Right. Yeah. One, one, one other. Yes. One other. Uh, one other <laughs> thought about this is that uh, uh, there should be a simple device for a general like. I, uh, the uh, simplest device, yeah. I think, that it hasn't gone through randomized clinical for, for trial, general will, will be the cable implants. Yeah. And so, there should be, for each country, a dedicated structural heart center yes. for the most complex uh, procedures. My question, actually, to Dr. Cliff. It's very interesting, actually, when you see the improvement or the prognosis of the tricuspid regurg and how much it's ignored in the treatment. Do you think is it because uh, we don't understand very well the tricuspid regurg uh, or the underlying cause for the tricuspid regurg, and when we should refer this patient with the TR for uh, for uh, any intervention regarding the pulmonary arteriosclerotic pressure, the RV size, and all of these things and the preparation? So, what really criteria you want before you refer the patient to tricuspid intervention? and uh, the timing. So, indications for tricuspid valve intervention would be someone who has refractory right heart failure, uh, who is refractory uh, to diuretics and continues to have symptoms. The, the thing is, uh, symptoms of tricuspid regurgitation can be somewhat um, ambiguous. It could just be fatigue. It's not, uh, not all patients present with ascites and uh, edema and all that. Some of it can be more subtle. Uh, generally speaking, uh, <clears throat> anyone who has refractory tricuspid regurgitation and symptoms related to it should be referred for a tricuspid valve intervention earlier. I showed data showing the outcomes on uh, surgery for isolated TR. And they're not good. And the reason they're not good, most students of the field realize, is due to their late presentation. So I think physicians need to send them a little bit earlier before they have hepatic cirrhosis, congestive hepatopathy, and uh, refractory ascites. How about patients with high pulmonary artery systolic pressure? Patients high what? Pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Yeah. Well, you know, is this, this, is a this is a complicated uh, patient population, right? Because they have a, essentially an untreatable disease with a secondary uh, impact of chronic tricuspid regurgitation. So you can, uh, those kinds of patients, those kinds of patients are generally eliminated, excluded from all the randomized clinical trials of catheter-based therapy for obvious reasons. But uh, on a palliative sense, if patient presents with refractory ascites, lower extremity edema, with pulmonary vascular hypertension due to intrinsic pulmonary pathology, I would consider them for a percutaneous palliation, although their overall survival is not going to be affected. Okay, with that being said, it's my pleasure to close this session, and thanks uh, for the audience uh, for attending the session. We break, break 20 minutes, huh? and then we'll come back.